Well, beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, what a sad passage is before us this afternoon. It's also a strange passage, that's true. But it's especially a sad passage, a sad chapter. And many times that's been true in, in this study of Samuel. You, you haven't heard all the sermons, of course, but you know the story. Many times when Saul is featured, it's, it's quite discouraging. It's quite, it's quite distressing even. And certainly the chapter that's before us is no exception. In fact, it's this chapter that may seem even to be saddest of all. Because here we can say, here we find Saul really at the bottom. Saul in the very depths, mentally, emotionally, morally, spiritually. He can't go much lower than this when he visits the home of a witch. And here we find really in this chapter God sealing Saul's doom. Isn't that what is happening? Isn't that what is being told to us really? God sealing Saul's doom. In this strange story involving Saul in the home of this woman and with her trying to bring forth someone from the dead. We'll talk about that more in a moment. But Samuel appearing of all things and appearing and, and speaking with Saul and speaking the judgment of God. The judgment of God upon Saul's life. It's a terrible word. It's a, a spine-chilling word, really. And why are we given it in Scripture? Isn't it in part that we read these verses and we learn to say, Lord, let me never be what Saul is here. Let me never come to this end that he came to here. It is important that we learn to say that. Because if it could happen to Saul, it could happen to you. It could happen to me. We should never think that it couldn't. We should never think that. And no doubt to reinforce the point, we get this chapter and we get it in quite a bit of detail. God sealing Saul's doom. That's our theme. And let's notice this afternoon the setting and the message and the lesson. The setting, the message, and the lesson. First of all, the setting. We start with the setting because the text makes a major point of it. The text describes Saul in the house of this woman, again traditionally known as a witch, more literally according to our translation, a medium. Saul is in her house and Saul is seeking her help in order to speak to Samuel. Now this should be striking to us and for two reasons. One, Samuel is dead. The text makes a point of that in verse 3. Samuel is dead. He's been dead for some time. We can read that earlier in Samuel. So that's one thing. Samuel is dead. And further, mediums and spiritists like this woman, in other words, people who say they can talk with the dead, that's what mediums are, spiritists, people who say they have contact with the souls of those who have passed on. And of course, they don't really. They can't. I mean, when we die, we leave this world and no, no one is able to bring us back. No, no mere man or woman, can do that. And so that means that these mediums and these spiritists, they were, of course, scams and frauds. And still that's true. Don't ever believe someone who tells you they can speak with the dead. They're just pretending. They're just making that up. Or else what they're doing is channeling evil spirits, entering into some sort of contact with the devil, Although that is, even that is unclear. But, but talking with the dead, th that, that cannot be. It's a deception. And it's an abomination even to the Lord. It's a, it's a pagan practice or a pagan, uh, a pagan preference, a pagan boast even. And, and because of that, the Lord said long ago, don't, don't ever engage in that. Don't ever go to them. Don't ever believe them. Don't, don't even let them live in the land. We can read that in Exodus, in Leviticus, in Deuteronomy. No mediums were to be allowed. In fact, Saul himself had been faithful to that word. We read that in verse 3. 
He had put the mediums and the spiritists out of the land. That wasn't his own preference or his own arbitrary choice. That was obedience to the word of God. Sometime in the past, he had done that. And still today, isn't it true, we need to stay away from everything that is witch-like in this sense and games and and people and, and, and practices to do with mediums and spiritists or else with the devil and the demonic world. Even, even to read a horoscope, even just for fun. Really, we have no business whatsoever getting started with any of that. Even just to investigate, much less to enjoy such things for entertainment. It's all the way of the world. The world apart from God. And really it's to engage in idolatry, and the Lord hates idolatry of whatever kind. And yet to say all that here now is Saul. And where is he? He is in this home of this woman. He is there together with two servants in this place called Endor, in a medium's house. And when he is there, Saul says, can you call up for me Samuel? Can you bring for me Samuel back from the dead? Now why? Why would Saul be here? And why would he be asking for this? What's going on? What's the background? Well, it turns out, as, as you know, something is very seriously wrong in Israel. We could read it in the early verses of our text. Three things in particular. One is the Philistines are again on the move. They are again on the attack. They have come and they have camped at a place called Shunem, which is a bit further north than they were used to uh, camping and, and attacking. And they are now here as a new threat and a dangerous threat. And Saul sees them as... His network of intelligence gathers that they are there. He's afraid of them. He he marshals his army. He gets all of Israel. But Saul's own spirit is very troubled. We read in verse 5 that his heart trembled greatly. The truth is Saul is terrified. Saul is scared like he has never been. He is no longer as brave as in times past. He's no longer able to see a danger and be courageous. Instead, his heart is shaking, it's trembling. We might say here is a king who is in full panic attack. And then there's one more thing that makes Saul so desperate. Not just the Philistines, not just his mortal terror, but worst of all, worst of all, God does not answer him. Verse 6, when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him either by dreams or by Urim or by the prophets. So on the one hand, Saul was in great need, but at the same time, God was altogether silent. Can you imagine that? No word for Saul. No light for Saul. No way forward for Saul. Heaven was as brass. Heaven was altogether closed and silent. Now, we might wonder at this. We might say, why? Why didn't God hear Saul in his time of trouble? Isn't he a God who hears and answers prayer? Why didn't God come to the aid of Saul? And one answer to that is is that there is no indication in the text that Saul is, in any sense, a repentant man. You can't find it. He's not a man who is sorry for his sin, for all his sin. We don't hear him say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's a prayer God loves to hear. That's a prayer we can say God is bound to answer. But we don't hear it from Saul. He just wants to know what he should do, as he tells Samuel later. He just wants some insight regarding the approaching battle. Just give me some some clues as to what's about to happen. But, But meanwhile, there's no contrition. There's no confession. Saul is not a sorry man. But what's also true is that with Saul, God's silence is a further judgment of Saul. This is a most sobering point to consider. But here, think of the words of Proverbs 1. Proverbs 1, where Lady Wisdom and the Lord ultimately gives gives a warning about those who won't hear and who won't turn. Listen to Proverbs 1, verse 25. Because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your terror comes. And then verse 28. 
Then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me. The turning away of the simple will slay them. Now, congregation, is that not what we see here in the life of Saul? He had spent so many years in rebellion against the Lord. Years. And even now, even at this moment when the enemy is once more at the borders of the land, and this time Saul has lost all of his natural courage and boldness and strength. He has nothing in himself anymore. He's reduced to great trembling. We don't hear him. We don't see him on his face before God saying, I'm sorry for the whole history of my sin. He doesn't turn. And so God is silent. If in my heart I sin regard, my prayer he will not hear. We sing that sometimes from Psalter 174. And in the experience of Saul, this is exactly what is happening. But Saul in his spirit cannot take it anymore, the uncertainty, the not knowing. And altogether with all of his fear, he has to find out something. And so if God will not talk to him, well, maybe he can hear from a prophet. Maybe he can hear from old Samuel. But of course, Samuel is dead, so isn't that door closed as well? Maybe not. And see, here is when Saul descends even deeper into the depths because he comes up with the idea of asking a medium to help. What about having one of those people who supposedly can speak with the dead? Maybe one of them can call up Samuel. See, here is Saul revealing his pagan mind, his pagan heart. And so in spite of all the previous removal of the mediums, as per his royal decree at one point, the, the servants of Saul, they, they know how to accommodate his request. They know where to find a woman, and together they go there. And Saul, he goes in disguise. He doesn't need this woman to know he's the king, given the former decree. And so he gets into this woman's house. He assures her that it's no trap, that her life is secure. And then he says, please, I want Samuel. Please bring up Samuel for me. And so presumably the woman starts the process. Whatever it was, and, and we really have no idea, some words maybe, some tricks, some, insight, some incense, who knows. But she had this down pat, probably a routine that she would do many times for people. And then she could say at a certain point, I see him or I see her. What do you want to know or what do you want to say? That's how she plied her trade. But this time, something was different. This time, we might say, contrary to her expectation, this time something happened. This time it, it worked. And it seems as if the woman herself is, is surprised because we read in verse 12, when the woman saw Samuel, she cried. She cried out with a loud voice. She gave a shout there in the darkness of the night in her house, conducting this seance. This woman was, was surprised by what she saw. Because this was unusual, was extraordinary. A spirit ascending out of the earth, she says, and the form of an old man covered with a mantle. And the point seems to be this whole thing was a surprise. This medium, this woman, wasn't used to real spirits ascending out of the earth. That's not how it went for her. Most times she was making it up. Or something else maybe, but this, this was different. Here she was not in control. Here was a real spirit. Here was an old man with a mantle. Yes, here was Samuel. No wonder she cried. She cried out. Can you imagine? It must have been something like if we're on the road sometimes and we witness a near collision and someone in the car gives a scream or maybe in your house you find a spider or a snake or something and you say, ah! Suddenly this woman knew this was, this was different. And suddenly knew, this woman too knew who was asking for Samuel. Because she turns to the king and she says, You are Saul. You are Saul. Now how did she know that? We can't say for sure. Maybe Samuel said Saul's name. Maybe the woman suddenly realized who else but Saul would want to speak to Samuel. In any case, now she knew. Now she feared was she not now a dead woman? 
But Saul assured her, it's all right, it's okay, carry on. What did you see? And then we read about Saul stooping his face to the ground and bowing down before Samuel. And whether Saul could see Samuel or not, we don't know. But he perceived that Samuel was near in some form, in some way, that he had come. And then Samuel speaks and he says, why have you disturbed me? And Saul tells his story, all about the Philistines and his distress and God's silence. And he needs a word. And he needs to know what to do. And he's so anxious. Well, let's pause here for a moment and just try to take in this scene now all together. On the one hand, Saul is clearly in the depths, visiting one of these people that the Lord had banned from being in the land. Saul had banned. And now Saul is here and he's asking her to do her thing. And he's seeking by way of Samuel to get a word, to get an insight. How is this any way to live? God hated this. God hated this. How deeply Saul has sunk. Now to pursue a means God had expressly said, you shall not do, you shall not make use of. It's pagan. Whatever could make Saul think this was right or that it would work. Of course, maybe you're thinking, but what's strange about all of this is that it does work. I mean, here is Saul speaking to Samuel, Samuel, speaking to Saul. How do we explain that? How do we understand that? To the surprise of the medium, it seems. It didn't usually go this way. Other, other times he had to make it all up. Or maybe the devil took over and maybe the devil ran things. Perhaps that happens sometimes. There are some people who think that that's what happened here too. That it wasn't Samuel who came up. After all, how could that be? They say, here must be an evil spirit impersonating Samuel. And maybe, maybe that's so. But the problem with that view is that nowhere ever does the text suggest that. Instead, the text says, it was Samuel. And Samuel spoke. But how still is it possible that it is really Samuel? And that's a fair question. And we can't give maybe a complete or a, 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 a totally satisfactory answer to that. But can we not say at least this, that somehow God seems to have permitted this. In spite of the fact that Saul is sinning in this moment and using a means and a method that God had said no to, in spite of that, and likewise, in spite of the fact that ordinarily it is not possible for the living to speak with the dead and the dead with the living, nevertheless, in this moment, God seems sovereignly still to make use of it in this extraordinary way. Once more, God will use his old prophet. Let's not forget that Samuel is no ordinary man. He's, he was a prophet. Many years later, God will bring Moses and Elijah to the mountain of transfiguration and they will appear there with Jesus and they will witness to some of the disciples. So it's not above the Lord to do such a thing. But here now, it seems he brings Samuel. Samuel. And let's remember too, it's not for a nice conversation. It's for a judgment. That's important to remember. Here is Saul. He's at the very end, as it were, but he's as hard and as stubborn, and, and, and yet he's desperate for a word, and, and so he sinks into these low, low depths, and he's in this witch's house, and he wants to hear from the dead, from Samuel, and God is saying, as it were, all right, I'll accommodate you, Sam Saul. I'll accommodate you. Samuel will come, but he will come in his judgment. Indeed, there is no blessing in what follows. And here, let's listen then to our second point, the message. So we've considered the setting. But now what about the message? And the text gives emphasis to the message. Verse 16 through 19. Saul wanted to hear from Samuel. Well, he did. What does Samuel say? It's a fearful thing. The, the whole section, Samuel begins with a question. Why do you ask me, seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? Your enemy. Isn't that by itself enough to make us tremble? Certainly for Saul. The Lord has departed from you, Saul, and the Lord has become your enemy. 
See, that's what happens when you live all your life in sinful rebellion against God, when you know better. And further, Saul says to, or Samuel says to Saul, verse 17, The Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David. Now, if you remember the story, you remember back in 1 Samuel 15, Saul had laid hold of Samuel's robe and it tore. And Samuel had turned and said to Saul, The Lord has torn the kingdom away from you. That was back in 15, here in 28. Samuel just, is just repeating the point and reminding Saul of that word. And Saul, it happened just like I said it would. Just like God said it would. And why did God say it would? Well, that too Samuel highlights. Verse 18, Because you did not, have, you did not obey the voice of the Lord, nor execute His fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this day. So if you remember back in 1 Samuel 15, the Lord had said to Saul, destroy Amalek. It was divine justice for all the brutality that Amalek had shown towards Israel throughout the generations. And so the Lord said, enough for Amalek. Saul, you need to be my instrument of divine justice. Except Saul didn't carry through with the assignment. At most, he did a half job. He saved many animals alive. He saved the king alive. It was disobedience. Sheer, arrogant disobedience. And Saul had nothing but flimsy excuses to justify it. It was the people. It was for sacrifice. No, Saul. It was disobedience. And it came for Saul on the heels of other failures, other shortcomings, other rebellions. He was a man who was on the trajectory of rebelling continually against God. And at that moment in 1 Samuel 15, the heart of Saul was so fully revealed. He was so ungodly and so unwilling to change that God said, that's it. It's fearful. It's solemn. But God said, that's it. And since that time, Saul only grew worse and worse and worse, descending into madness trying to kill several times his own son-in-law, David. And now at this moment, in seeking out the services of a medium in order to contact the dead, he was revealing the express disobedience and hardness of his heart. In 1 Chronicles 10, verse 13 and 14, we read about this visit of Saul to this woman's house being one of the reasons for Saul's ultimate demise. It was another indication of where he was morally and spiritually far, far, far from God. And so all that is left for Saul is judgment. And that's the way Samuel finishes his message. Verse 19, Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Saul, Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will deliver the army of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Well, Saul had wanted to know what was going to happen and what he should do. Here now he finds out. It's all over, Saul. You're all finished. You and your men will lose. And tomorrow you and your sons, some of them at least, will be with me. And Samuel does not mean with me in heaven, with the Lord. He means with the dead. You will die. What a message for Saul. Tomorrow you will die. If he was in trouble before this message came, if he was trembling before that, now when he hears it, after God has through Samuel sealed his doom, it is at this point that Saul is altogether undone. We read in verse 20 that immediately Saul, and if you can just picture this, he fell full length on the ground and he was dreadfully afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him. Part of the reason for that was that he had been without food for a day and a night. Maybe he was too anxious to eat. But now that weakness, together with this message, at this point Saul has simply nothing left. And he falls face down on the ground. And is it not a picture, a vivid and fearful picture of everyone who thinks they can do life on their own? It may work for a while. You may do well for a while. But inevitably, you will fall, and you will be no better than a worm flat on the ground.
The rest of the passage tells how the medium tries to rouse Saul and feed him. And at first he refuses. Eventually his servants join with the woman in urging Saul and finally he agrees and so he sits on the bed and she prepares a meal. It's a good meal. Fatted calf, unleavened bread. Saul eats there with his servants, probably Saul's last meal. And then we read in verse 25, they rose and went away that night. They had come in the night. We can read that in verse 8. They had come in the night, and when they left, it was still night. Something like Judas later, when he will betray the Lord Jesus, and when he will leave the disciples and the upper room, and he will enter into the night, the gospel says. What a picture it presents of the whole of Saul's life. It was all dark. It was all dark. And it was about to get darker. Well, that's the story. And again, what a sad story. What a distressing story. What's the lesson? Why are we told this? Why is it given to us in all these details? Well, let's consider that in our last point, the setting, the message, and the lesson. In other words, what are we meant to learn, what are we meant to learn from this history? Well, in view of this chapter and in view of what all of the Bible teaches, we might say the lesson is twofold. For example, isn't one obvious point to hear all this, to, to read all this, to believe all this, and then to resolve never ever to live as Saul lived? I mean, never to live in ongoing rebellion against God. Never to live in blatant and repeated disobedience to His commandments. Never to live nurturing a hard heart and a stubborn spirit. Because if you do, if you live like Saul, your life will end like Saul's, far from God, under his judgment, and about to be destroyed by him. That's what will happen. And don't we need to hear this, congregation? Not every day, maybe. Not every sermon, but certainly from time to time. It's a warning, of course, a very serious one. But don't we need it? Isn't it all too easy to live like Saul? I mean, choosing to live your own way, never mind God's way. In effect, setting aside the Word of God and saying, but I will do it the way I think is best. Isn't that an ever-present temptation? And are you falling for it? Some of you young people listening, or some of you may be making choices today that aren't good, that aren't wise, that aren't right. Some of you may be making choices with regard to alcohol or drugs or sex or maybe with regard to witch-like things, satanic-like things, things you are reading or playing or watching or listening to that are feeding your mind and, and, and leading your heart in a particular way. Some of you, are you making choices that are clearly contrary to God's Word and therein showing the same spirit of Saul? I do life my way, not God's way. Or maybe it's not so extreme for you. Maybe, maybe it's just that the overall focus of your life is not godliness, it's worldliness. And you're just living, working, striving to make it in terms of this world. You love what this world loves. All of the pleasures, all of the enjoyments, all of the treasures that you can find here. You want it. And meanwhile, the Lord is set aside, really. You have no time for Him. Do you understand how Saul-like that is? Do you understand where that will lead you? You know, no one starts out in a witch's house. That's not where it starts. But many a godless life ends there. And it becomes the last stop before hell. And this is a warning not just for young people. What about us who are a little bit older or even elderly among us? If in one or more areas 
of your life. You are not obeying the Lord, and you know it. And you won't address it, and you do nothing to change it. Maybe in your home and family. Maybe in your work, or with your friends, or in your habits, or with your entertainment, or something. Living in disobedience, and you know, and you won't stop. Then you are living like Saul. And you may not think so, or you may not see how serious it is. And you may scoff at the idea that you could someday end up in the home of a witch. But you shouldn't scoff. If it could happen to Saul, it could happen to you. It could happen to me. And that's surely part of the point of this passage. Look at Saul here. Look at him. And any one of us, if we allow ourselves to live in rebellion, contrary to how we are taught by our parents, contrary to how we are instructed by our pastor, contrary to how we are led by the Word of God. If we live in rebellion, we are on the same road that Saul walked, and there is no guarantee that we will ever get off. And this chapter is given to us in the Word of God to help us say, oh, let that never happen to me. Because how terrible if it does. Just think again of Saul trembling. Trembling as he comes to this home. Trembling as he hears Samuel speak. Flat on the ground and afraid for everything when Samuel is finished. And just think of Saul now, today, and where he is. And if you are any bit like him this afternoon, how serious. And yet listen, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Today, if you will hear his voice, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord. If only Saul would have done that, but he didn't. Perhaps he couldn't. Perhaps it was too late. He had sinned too long and too hard. Perhaps it was too late. But it is not too late for you and for me. We're given this chapter. We're being given this sermon. And just that is proof that the Lord is caring and calling still. And so let us hear Him. And let us hear the warning and learn the lesson not to live as Saul lived. And if you are convicted in your conscience this afternoon to fall before the Lord in repentance and to say, Help, Lord, deliver me from myself. And from my rebellion. But how do we do that? How do we get delivered? Let that be how we finish this afternoon. How ultimately do we not live as Saul lived? You know, that question becomes all the more pressing when we know something of our own heart. The truth is, a Saul-like heart lives in every one of us by nature. That's our sin. And we need to see that. And God's people do. And the question then is, how do we not live like Saul? And how do we not end like Saul? Do you know the answer? There's only one. It's a glorious one. The answer is to look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ. He who is the king of all kings. King Saul is just one of many. Jesus Christ is the king of all kings. And if we think of him, and if we consider him, on the one hand, he never lived like Saul lived. He was always obedient to his father. He was never rebellious in his heart. He was never unfaithful. He he lived in a way that was so pleasing to God on high. At every single point in all his words and works and ways, Jesus Christ the King was exemplary, was spotless in his service. But then what happened to him? If we think of the climax of Jesus' life, don't we have to say that In spite of his perfect life, God nevertheless became his enemy. Isn't that what happened? When God departed from Jesus and God made his judgment to fall upon Jesus. Saul complained that God had departed from him. God was silent to him. That was true, but Saul deserved it. But then think of Jesus when he said, My God, why have you forsaken me? 
And it was because Jesus deserved it, not in himself, but as the sin bearer. As he was bearing in his own body the sin of all his people, the disobedience and rebellion of all his people, he was made to be sin. And so he was forsaken. And congregation, we know that could not be an easy thing. Just remember how Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane contemplating the coming suffering and he was sprawled on the ground and he was in utter agony. Think of Saul in the witch's house, flat on his face. Even more, think of Jesus. As in his humanity, his holy humanity, he saw what he, what he was about to endure and he shrank from it. Because how could he endure it? And he wrestled with his father. We know that, that prayer that he had in the garden. And then he surrendered to his father. And he went forward and he went to the cross. And he hung on that cross with all that that meant, including to be forsaken. And you know, congregation, that's the gospel, isn't it? That's the good news that we love to hear, that we need so desperately. Because he was forsaken, that means I don't have to be forsaken. Though I deserve it as much as anyone, just for my sin in Adam, never mind the multitude and the magnitude of my own sin and sins. And that's the case with all of us, every single one of us. But if we look in faith to Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can say we believe in Him. He who is Savior, He who is King, who was forsaken for me, then He was judged for me, so that I will not be forsaken, so that I will not be judged. Not forsaken in this life and not judged in the life to come. And so we must look to Him. We must look to Him. Even as He is presented to us again this afternoon, He is the only way out. He is the only way forward. He is the only way to life. Look to Him. And that means to go to Him in prayer and seek His mercy and His grace, asking Him to forgive you and aiming to live in all faithfulness to Him by the power of His Holy Spirit. When that's our response, congregation, as so many of us confess, and that it be renewed again this afternoon. When that's our response, then God doesn't seal our doom as we deserve. And like he did for Saul. No, he does not seal our doom. He promises, he guarantees our life, even eternal life. Oh, let us learn then from Saul. Truly learn and let us look to Jesus Christ alone. Amen. Let us sing in response from Psalter number 420. 420.